and welcome back to our final Art Path Artist Talk series. My name is Sabrin Stevens. I'm a gallery associate. With me today I have Michelle Carlson, who's our acting executive director, Katrina Daniels, and as well as Sarah Parker. Um, the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center is a nonprofit organization that's been a staple in the Lansing community for 50 years and a leader in the creation of public art in Lansing for the last 12 years. Art Path, which is celebrating its fifth year this year, is one of those public art programs. Art Path is um, the result of the hard work of Katrina Daniels as well as Emily Stevens, who's um, from the City of Lansing's Parks and Recreation Department. And then I want to say thank you to our sponsors for Art Path, which is Rathburn Insurance and Auto Owners Insurance, as well as our site sponsor, which is the Lansing Symphony Orchestra. Um, and I will turn it over to Kelly O'Neill for today. Thank you. Yeah. I love your name, Sabrin. Thank you. Is it a family name? It's really pretty. Uh, my mom kind of made it up. So. Well, it's beautiful. <laughs> Sounds like you're Scottish or something. You I've know? gotten that a few times in the past month. You get the red hair too. That kind of helps. So hello, my name is Kelly O'Neill, and I am a uh, sculpture artist. And the piece we'll be talking about today is the Mandarin windows behind us there. So um, I thought today I would start from the beginning and talk about my dad first. He was kind of a big influence on me. He was um, a Renaissance man. He had many interests and, and skills and his hobbies from uh, sandal uh, or candle making with sand, if you've ever seen that, mm -hmm. those torches. Uh, he had a full dark room for photography. He oil painted. He even poured his own lead weights for scuba diving. He was just a hands-on kind of guy. And uh, for the last 20 years of his life, he was a potter and, um, and very prolific at it. And he made beautiful vessels and plates and teapots and so forth. And him and my mom would do art shows in Southeast Michigan and uh, they just loved it. That was his hobby. And um, I would always talk to my dad about, you know, maybe working with him and, you know, he taught me the craft of pottery and so forth, but he would buy his easels for his plates like at a Hobby Lobby shop or something like that and and I said dad you know we need to differentiate your work and you know elevate it not just physically elevate it but differentiate it from the other potters at the art fairs and he thought it was a great idea and uh, you know, I'd sketch or we'd talk about different ideas and he really encouraged me but I was a working mom and he never found the time and finally I enrolled in a welding course at Washtenaw and unfortunately that same year he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And he passed away before we ever had a chance to collaborate together on our art. Uh, but he was a hopeful man. And so even during his you know, illness, he still threw pottery. And um, after he passed, he had greenware and bisqueware in his, in his studio. And I told my mom I would complete the work for him. So on, uh, on the weekends and Saturdays, I would go to his studio and. I would be glazing or firing and finishing up his work. And one Saturday, my mom got really quiet and she says, you know, I kind of feel dad's spirit. And I think he's telling us we should do a show. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And so she contacted Farmington. There's Art on the Grand. They have an art fair every June. And they love my dad. He had done that show for decades. And so they invited me to come to the show, which is actually kind of unusual because usually the artist has to be at those jurid shows, but they love my dad. And so they said, sure, come on. And I displayed my work and his work together. And I got such wonderful feedback from, you know, friends and family and just, you know, people attending the art fair that they loved how the combination of the metal and the clay kind of created a new sculpture, a new way of displaying a throne vessel. So I did bring an example here today to show you. This is one I, one I keep, I'm this one's, and so this is my dad's pot, which is beautiful on its own, and you know, it can easily be displayed, but I went ahead and made a holder for it, so that it, you know, it's made out of recycled metal, but it elevates the pot, and it was designed specifically to hold this pot by following the, the curvature of the vessel, and so, that is how I got started, and that was 10 years ago, and um, I've had so much personal success with the journey that I was able to retire from General Motors four years ago, and now I do art full time. I call it my life 2.0, right? <laughs> um, and I started the, uh, the journey with really wanting to use 
uh, recycled or repurposed metal. So I would go to a scrapyard or I would go to Salvation Army with a magnet and if it's stuck, I knew I could weld it, right? So I had, you know, bins and shells of silverware and lamp pieces and people were giving me their brake rotors and I just had a bunch of uh, random pieces of metal and one piece of metal would inspire me and that's what I would use to make the, the design. And it's something about taking something utilitarian and creating art from it pleased me. I liked that aesthetic. And so the modern windows is a perfect example of that. I was driving down the road and uh, there was a wagon wheel for sale on the side of the road. And you know, I pulled over and I was lucky enough that I was in my Silverado. So I had the bed empty behind me and I got it for $40. And so I went home and I just dismantled it. And um, I want to talk a little bit about my creative process. So I kind of have two creative processes and Modern Windows is a, an example of how I intuitively create. And it's where a piece of metal just inspires the sculpture. There's no sketching. There's no finished picture in my mind. It's, um, it's a process and I, I, Align it with like an athlete who says they're like in the zone or a runner who gets that runner's high. So when I'm in my studio and I've got that wheel and I and, and that's my canvas and then I'm gonna fill all that negative space with something, I just I just let it go. I, I don't feel the pain of aches that you know I get at my age and my joints. I don't feel hunger, I don't hear what's going on around me. I am just loving the process of creating and there's no second guessing there's no self-criticism there's um, only confidence and just joy for the process and that's really why I do it I think it's just to feel that high um, and that's really what it feels like to me and Mondrian Windows is an example of one of those uh, creations which was literally created intuitively the wheel was there and I just grabbed whatever was left on my shelf or that I had gotten from the scrap that's just started building and welding and so forth. I knew I wanted it to be bright. I knew I wanted to add glass, but that was about the only direction I had in the creation of the design. And um, the name is from Piet Mondron, who is, he's an uh, abstract uh, artist from the early 20th century. He's a Dutch painter actually. But if, but if those of you from the 60s remember those color black dresses, and I think every 20 year old had one of his posters in their college dorm or something, but he, um, he used a lot of color blocking and geographic patterns in his art, and it was asymmetric, and it was unique, and it was bright, different for that time of that era, right, in the early 20s and 30s. And, um, and so that was part of the inspiration, as well as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who was another huge ins inspiration for me. Many of you know him as an architect, but he was a painter. I actually had his calendar when I was in high school. He actually did calendars. And he did a lot of geometric shapes on top of geometric shapes. Um, and then he would color in portions of the overlap area. And there was just something about the geometry behind both of those artists that just really appealed to me. And I should tell you, I never use a ruler when I'm into it. I don't use angle, I just create. And I look for balance in my eye it's not you know 45 inches over here and 45 it's just I look I try to balance it I'm actually one of those people that are really good at centering a picture on the wall without measuring so if you ever need someone I can do that for you but it's just something I love to do right is um, just create intuitively and like I said modern windows is a perfect example of that it has almost every element from the wheel itself um, as well as other aspects, and of course the glass is from Delphi here in Lansing, you know, Delphi glass. And, um, and it's got the shapes within the shapes, so it's probably a perfect example of my aesthetic. The other creative process I have is when um, I have a client. And of course, having a client put some boundaries around what you have to do. I'm taking another person's point of view into my creative process. The advantages are they're not coming to me unless they like my aesthetic. So no one's asking me to make a, you know, realistic bronze ballerina statue, right? So they're not coming to me for that. They're coming to me for something that is abstract and contemporary. Um, but I find joy in that too. And it, I think it could be part of 
my experience with General Motors, so um, I was in advertising and I was the client. So I would go out on shoots and you know there'd be directors and there'd be actors and there'd be you know props and all that going on and you know I'd be in Video Village watching on the screen and you know and that was what I did and I love that it was creative but I wasn't physically doing the creative I was just you know making it having other people be their you know, experience their creative dreams but part of that process was the creative teams would bring us campaigns in which stories that they wanted to tell. And then as a client, I'd be like, hmm, I like that story, and I like that part of that story. Can you put them together, you know? Just a typical client, right? So, um, but I learned a lot from that, and I actually use that with my clients in the sense that I interview them, I get a feel for what they need, what they're looking for, and then I'll sketch, and I'll give them three or four different sketch ideas, and then I ask for feedback on those sketches, and then I'll sketch again, and then I'll send them videos of the processes I'm making it to keep them involved as much as I can. And then, and that feels good because I feel like there's a, there's, a, there's a collaboration there, there's some teamwork that's going on. And then when I'm able to install or deliver it and then see their joy um, when I've achieved what they were looking for. And then as well as seeing, you know, the complimentary art that they also curated and how my piece fits in with all of that. It's just, it's a, it's a really great feeling. And I, I just feel like we all should surround ourselves with things that make us happy, right? That create joy in our life. Whether it's your, your you know, like a beautiful garden like this, or it's family photos that you take, or if it's, you know, your embroidery or art you make yourself, like find something joyful and creative that you can surround yourself with. So, um, and like I said, I'm very grateful that I had General Motors, you know, as a, as a career for 34 years, and that gave me the opportunity to retire and start this, I call it Life 2.0, and this journey. Um, and all those skills that I learned in corporate America, I have been able to apply to my art world, which is great, um, and I'm very thankful for that. And, you know, I hope if you're passionate about something, don't wait till you're 57. <laughs> you know, I wish I think about that now I'm like what would my career tra trajectory should have been if I did it when I was 30 right um, like I said I could probably work about five hours a day before it's like a three Advil day um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah follow your passion find something you love find something that gives you joy and just surround yourself with it and um, and so that's my story and um, thanks for coming out I know it's short uh, but uh, I had a chance to talk about my dad, and that's great because then, you know, he continues to live on um, in the stories that I tell, and, um, and I hope you love the work. I did bring uh, some of my sketch, so you can see how I work in sketching, and, and of course, if you want to find out about my exhibition at the Lansing Art Gallery in 2023, you can just go ahead and scan the QR code, and I'll put that in my... Um, it, under exhibits when it when I know the dates exactly which I think you're going to tell me have, soon yes yeah, okay yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm excited about that and so I hope you I hope we can I'll be friends and get to know each other <laughs> and um, and thank you again and, all right, so let's let's any questions or comments I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions yes uh, where is your welding studio now? Did you like convert the dining room? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was lucky enough that I had a three car garage. So once we had a co contractor come in, put a wall up, I had a heater in there. Oh. I have 220, oh, yeah. which is great. So I've got my kiln and my slab roller from the pottery work that I do. And I've got a, uh, a multi-processor welder. And, but I do a lot of my fabrication at a place called Maker Works in Ann Arbor. So they've got the large plasma cutter, they've got the roller, they have the horizontal saw, vertical saw you know, all the, the shears and things like that. So if I were to invest in, just in this piece alone, all the equipment that I used would have been like $50,000. <laughs> and again, uh, if I was 30, <laughs> I might have thought about that because I could depreciate it. But I figured I got like 10 good years left, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then I'll be doing paper mache. <laughs> How long was the welding class you took? Yeah, I took the Washtenaw class. It was an introductory to welding, so it was a typical uh, one, two, semester. one semester. And then I moved over to Schoolcraft that has a, an actual sculptural welding program. And I did that for three years. I just kept taking the course over and over again. 
but then they kicked me out. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they really, you know, I was in there making pieces that I was selling, and I think they, they really didn't they caught me. on. They caught on. <laughs> so, and so then I found a place in Northville Village, uh, the villages, and then they closed down, unfortunately, converted that to office space, and, and now I'm in Ann Arbor, and I love it. I love, there are great people down there, so. Do you guys have one of those in Lansing? A makerspace? Yes. Mm -hmm. We do. It's um, Actually, it's in this neighborhood. Is it? Yeah. Well, go check it out. <laughs> one of the things I'm going to do is I'm working with the, the team down there now is I'm going to do a make and take class. Mm -hmm. So we're going to figure out something that you can make in one in a couple of hours, okay. use a couple pieces of equipment, and then take it home. And we'll probably do mm -hmm. something for the holidays, Mother's Day, Father's uh, Day, and I'll be teaching that. So that'll be fun. Did yeah. you... Uh, as a woman taking, was it intimidating as a woman taking a welding class? Like, I, I've never taken one, but I, in my mind, I feel like it would be pretty, like, male-dominated. It is very male-dominated, but you'd be surprised how many women are getting into it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm generalizing, of course, but fine motor skills is really important in welding. It's, you know, to make a small little bead, you really have to have small, fine motor skills. Mm -hmm. So women are actually quite good at it, because they have really smaller hands, and they can get into smaller places. Um, but it, the, the industry is opening up. There are a lot of uh, organizations that support women in welding. And, um, and I never had, I was older at the time, mm -hmm. and you know, I was going to class with a bunch of you know, 20 year old college kids. Sure. And you know, especially when I was taking the welding course at, at uh, Schoolcraft, all they wanted to do was make a weapon. <laughs> can I make a knife? Oh, is this a sculpting class? Can I make a knife? Or what, what's the thing that swings with the mace? Oh, mace. Why can I make a mace? Like oh you know, boys. <laughs> so, but no, I. Um, it definitely is. But you know, keep in mind, I worked for General Motors for thirty years in the parts division, and then at Chevrolet. And I called on dealers, all male dominant. I don't, Hardcore man years. Uh, yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know what it's like to work in a woman dominant field. I really yeah. don't. I probably love it, but yeah, you learn to hold your own. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have a preference um, in terms of like scale? Like I've only ever worked with you on larger yeah. scale work. Yes. Yeah. But do you have a preference working um, more like tabletop size or working larger? Well, when I, when I, uh, that, that flow that I talked about, it, yeah. it's like, it's almost like a heartbeat, right? Mm -hmm. About once every two weeks, I just got to get out and create, like, it's, I'm stirring up the energy. And in those cases, I usually will make something that's, you know, 24 to 38 inches tall. Because it's easy, it's simple, I can get it done in a couple hours. Mm -hmm. So I do do a lot of smaller sculptures and tabletop sculptures. Um, I do do a lot of large scale. As a matter of fact, I was, I was telling Katrina, I got enough people asking me about largers, I put a postcard together of some of the larger pieces I've made because people will stop and say, um, you know what, I had this spot where I had a tree in my yard and it died <laughs> and I want to put a sculpture there and, and um, you know, I only bring to my art fairs things that are maybe six feet tall sure. and they're looking for something that's, you know, ten feet or so. So um, every time I do a large scale, I curse myself. <laughs> I just finished um, this one here, this one right here for um, Art Prize. Mm -hmm. So this one is eight feet tall and uh, seven feet wide and about three feet deep. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I wasn't sure I was gonna get it out of my garage. <laughs> I built it in my garage and I'm like, oh, I should have thought about the door. <laughs> so, but Is I was that able... the biggest piece you've ever done? Uh, no, I've done I've done 12 foot tall oh, wow. pieces before. I, I've had um, sculptures on uh, Schoolcraft campus, so that was easy because I could make them on campus and then just leave them there. <laughs> so some of them are still there. <laughs> They're just storing them for me. <laughs> I'll come get them eventually. <laughs> so those are good questions. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions you guys have? No? Well, thank you again for coming. I appreciate it. Do um, you want to like it? Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to share that Kelly was one of our artists um, that we worked with to do a commission piece for the new McLaren Hospital. Oh, so if you're after there, um, she's a beautiful sculpture that was custom. Yeah. 
That's the one right in the lobby when you first walked yes, in. Yes, underneath the, the stairs. The half circle. Yes. Circle. Yep. Yes, that's what I did. Very cool. I like that. That was fun because um, I knew the exact location it was going to be in. I knew it was going to be uh, seen from three sides, and I knew it was going to go up an open staircase. Mm -hmm. So, again, you know how I have the, the boundaries that the, the client gives me? So I knew the color palette. They yep. provided the color palette for me, and I knew the space. And then I knew I wanted, if you're walking up the stairs, you wanted to be able to look down. And I paid so much attention to what it looked like from above. So that was kind of fun. So a lot of those circles are at angles. And the mm -hmm. reason they're at angles is so that when you're walking up the stairs, you can see the glass. And, mm -hmm. and I knew it was going to be next to a window. So I wanted to use a lot of glass and so you could see the colors there. Mm -hmm. So I used opaque glass yeah. so, or uh, not opaque glass so you could see through it. So yeah. it's a picture right here. This one right here. Is that the one you're talking yes, about? Yes. 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 So that's the one right there. It's in the Ooh, McLaren. Very cool. You go ahead and pass that if you want to show people. So, yeah. So, again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any nice. closing comments you have to make? Or? I was just going to say thank you, thank you to everybody who came out today and all summer for all of our artist talks. Um, and have a good evening. Right. Thank you. <laughs>